Dear fellow truth seekers, thank you and welcome for visiting my channel, Mytho Religio. Mytho Religio is a series of books about religious comparison studies between the stories in Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism, directly from their sacred books and world mythologies, hence the name Mytho Religio. The purpose is to retrace the prehistory of humanity, since I am not fully satisfied with either the explanations from the point of view of creationists nor evolutionists. There are so many missing links in both explanations. If you feel the same, then you are on the right channel. In this book series, I will also analyze about the prehistory of humanity from the archaeological records, modern scientific point of view, and other alternative theories, such as the ancient alien theories and Atlantis or Lemuria legends. After thorough research of circa 30 years, I recognize many, many similarities between all religious stories and even mythologies, and surprisingly, some of them are in accordance or even beyond modern science that have been proven as correct. Thus, I came to the conclusion that all religions must have come from the same source. And all these religious stories and mythologies, although heavily jumbled up, are actually telling one mega story. The true prehistory of our common ancestors. This mega story is quite different than what we have been told to believe and will truly blow your mind as it is more fascinating than our imagination. If you have watched the earlier videos in this channel, I believe you can see some of the similarities too. If you haven't and you truly want to do a religious comparative study, I suggest that you do so. The best way to do a comprehensive religious study via this channel is by watching the videos starting from number 1 and continue until this present video and so on. That way you will see a clear pattern. For deeper analysis that I cannot share in this platform due to its sensitive nature that leads to the above conclusion, kindly read the books that are available in ebook format that can be found in my website www.mythoreligio.com or the physical books at Amazon in color or black and white version. Scientific Theories on the Origin of Life Part 2 Dear fellow truth seekers, Last week, I have shared with you the first part of the scientific theories on the origin of life. That video explained the history of how the theory of evolution came into being. I started from the Hindu belief of reincarnation until the well-known proposed theory of evolution by Darwin in 1859. The basic theory is that all species had descended from a single ancestor evolving from one another over time by slight variations. When Darwin proposed this theory, the science of genetics was practically unknown. The general public still held the assumption that living things had very simple structures. And at that period, scientists were still making various experiments, some pro and others contra to the theory of abiogenesis. That is a theory that proposes that creatures could arise from other organisms or from soil. That was the most prevalent scientific theory at that time. Many still believe that maggots appeared in meat were an evidence for this theory. In this video, I will continue how the Darwin theory of evolution became the modern theory of evolution. That is the most prevalent theory today that explains the origin of life. Law of Biogenesis In 1864, the French Catholic chemist Louis Pasteur announced the results of his scientific experiments, also known as the Law of Biogenesis, which is the opposite of abiogenesis. In a series of experiments similar to those performed earlier by Needham and Spallanzani, Pasteur demonstrated that life today does not arise in areas that have not been contaminated by existing life. For example, maggots that appeared in meat did not arise spontaneously. They were carried by flies in the form of larvae, i.e. newly hatched immature insects 
that are invisible to the naked eyes. Pasteur's empirical results, i.e. factual results, were summarized in the phrase omne vivum ex ovo, Latin for all life is from X. In other words, life forms such as mice, maggots, and bacteria cannot appear fully formed into the world without parents similar to themselves. By the middle of the 19th century, the theory of biogenesis had accumulated so much evidential support due to the work of Louis Pasteur and others that the alternative theory of abiogenesis had been effectively disproved. This theory, of course, put the theory of evolution in a difficult position. So how did the first living organism arise from the non-living things? Theory of Primordial Soup The theory of primordial soup was proposed to answer the question of how life originated on Earth. In 1871, Charles Darwin suggested how the original spark of life may have begun in a warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, lights, heat, electricity, etc. present, so that a protein compound was chemically formed ready to undergo still more complex changes. He continued that at the present day such matter would be instantly devoured or absorbed, which would not have been the case before living creatures were formed. In 1929, biochemist John Haldane, British, and Alexander Oparin, Russian, hypothesized independently that Earth's early atmosphere lacked free oxygen. They suggested that life began in a pond or ocean as a result of combination of chemicals from the atmosphere and some form of external sources of energy, like ultraviolet radiation or lightning to make amino acids, the building blocks of proteins, which would then evolve into all species. This is supposed to happen at least 3.8 billion to 3.55 billion years ago. In 1953, American chemists Harold C. Urey and Stanley Miller set out to test the operin haldane hypothesis. They reproduced the early atmosphere of Earth by creating a carefully controlled, closed system. The ocean was a warm flask of water. As water vapor rose from the water and collected in another chamber, Yuri and Miller introduced hydrogen, methane, and ammonia to simulate the oxygen-free atmosphere. Then, they discharged sparks representing lightning into the mixture of gases. Finally, a condenser cooled the gases into a liquid they collected for analysis. After a week, Yuri and Miller had astonishing results. Organic compounds were abundant in the cooled liquid. Most notably, Miller found several amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins, which themselves are the key ingredients of both cellular structures and cellular enzymes responsible for important chemical reactions. Yuri and Miller concluded that organic molecules could form in oxygen-free atmosphere and that the simplest of living things might not be far behind. Current Hypothesis Today, scientists propose two possible sources of organic, meaning living molecules, on the early Earth. One terrestrial origins, organic synthesis driven by impact shocks or by other energy sources such as ultraviolet light or electrical discharges. 2. Extraterrestrial origins, delivery by objects or gravitational attraction of organic molecules or primitive life forms from space. Although Yuri and Miller successfully created amino acids, until today, still no one has yet synthesized a protocell, original cell using basic components, which would have the necessary properties of life. Without such proof of principle, the explanations tend to be short on specifics. However, 
some researchers are working in this field. Thus, until today, the scientific answer to the origin of life still remains hypothetical. Laws of Genetic Inheritance The process of how species evolve into another species by transmitting their traits to the next generation is still not completely understood at the time of Lamarck and Darwin. Back then, it was commonly believed that inheritance was transmitted through blood. Darwin failed to understand an important aspect of natural selection. He realized that plant and animal populations are composed of individuals that vary from each other in a physical form. He also believed that nature selects from the existing varieties those traits that are most suited for their environment. However, if natural selection were the only process occurring, each generation should have less variation until all members of a population are essentially identical or clones of each other. That does not happen. Each new generation has new variations. Darwin was aware of this fact, but he did not understand what caused the variation. The first person to begin to grasp why this happens was an Austrian Catholic monk and botanist named Gregor Mendel. Through plant breeding experiments carried out between 1856 and 1863, he discovered that there is a recombination of parental traits in offspring. Allow me to explain in the simplest manner without using too many scientific terms to understand this. The traits from parental generation to offspring is not passed through blood, but through DNA. DNA is a molecule that contains biological instructions that make each species unique. This particular fragment of DNA that holds genetic information is called a gene. Genes pass from parents to offspring. Each gene has two alternative forms or variants called alleles. One allele of each organism comes from the mother, the other from the father. Some alleles are dominant, meaning they contain traits that will appear in the offspring, and some are recessive, meaning the traits they contain will disappear in the presence of a dominant allele. So, in this image, one parent of rose is red in color. And in this example, red is dominant, so it is marked as RR, capital R and capital R. The other parent is white in color, and in this example, white is recessive, so it is marked as RR, small r, and small r. When these two parents reproduce, the possibilities of their first generation offspring are a combination of the same four genes of RR, one big R and one small r. Since the big R is dominant, the results are four hybrid red roses. That is, red roses that actually contain recessive allele of small r, that is white in color, although it doesn't show up in appearance. But on the second generation, the combination of a hybrid red, big r, small r, and another hybrid red, big r, small r, will produce the possibility of big r, big r, which is red, big R, small r, which is hybrid red, big R, small r, hybrid red also, and small r, small r, white. This explains how variations show up from generation to generation. Sadly, Darwin and most other 19th century biologists never knew of Mendel and his research. It was not until the beginning of the 20th century that Mendel's pioneer research into genetic inheritance was rediscovered. This was long after his death. He never received the public acclaim that was eventually showered on Darwin during his lifetime. Thus, the evolution models of Lamarck as well as Darwin were invalidated by the discovery of the laws of genetic inheritance. In the middle of the 20th century, 
The discovery of the structure of DNA revealed that the nuclei or central of the cells of living organisms possess very special genetic information and that this information could not be altered by acquired traits. In other words, during its lifetime, even though a giraffe managed to make its neck a few centimeters longer by extending its neck to upper branches, this trait would not pass to its offspring. Genetic laws showed that acquired traits are not passed on, and that genetic inheritance takes place according to a certain unchanging laws. This law supported the view that species remain unchanged. It seems that no matter how many cows are bred with one another, they could change size or color and other traits, but the species itself would never change. Cows would always remain cows. The laws discovered by Mendel put Darwinism in a very difficult position. For these reasons, evolutionist scientists proposed a different model of evolution in the first quarter of the 20th century. And with that, the neo-Darwinism that has become the mainstream of the modern theory of evolution which we know today was born. Modern Theory of Evolution the modern theory of evolution was born during the meeting of Geological Society of America in 1941. An additional new theory was proposed to explain the cause of speciation, which is a concept of mutation. Mutations are changes in the structure of a gene resulting in a variant form which may be transmitted to the next generation. Random mutation is proposed and generally accepted today to provide the answer to the question of the origin of the advantageous variations which cause living organisms to evolve. In my later videos, we will study further about random mutation and speciation. But before we do that, I will share with you the timeline of evolution on Earth from the birth of the Earth to the appearance of modern humans, i.e. Homo sapiens, according to the modern theory of evolution. For now, allow me to thank you for watching and hope to see you next week.